Well, thank you very much. Usually when a uh, politician gets up, uh, everybody expects uh, him or her to take credit for the work of others, so I'm not going to do that. Um, but what I am going to do is uh, thank the Goodwins for understanding and working with the county on our process. When, when you work with the kind of lumber that they work with, uh, attention to detail and understanding how processes work is what it's all about. And they've been model citizens when it comes to dealing with a very complex planning and zoning issue out here and environmental issues. And we, we truly appreciate their willingness to work with the county and their patience with the process. Um, I really don't want to uh, talk about the, the things that you would expect me to talk about, the importance of jobs and manufacturing and all that. I want to talk about longleaf pine trees because longleaf pine trees, we, we all live someplace where there were once vast longleaf pine savannas. And the history of this place is very much about the longleaf pine. As a matter of fact, if you look at the canoes that, that were exposed in Lake Pithlachoco, Noonan's Lake, there were over 100 canoes, all made of longleaf pine, except for maybe two cypress ones. And they were very unique. They had thwarts that were built in, uh, the trees out there were immense. They still are. Uh, the world's longest, uh, the world's tallest loblolly pine is still on the shores of Noonan's Lake. But what's interesting is this place 5,000 years ago was a center for longleaf pine manufacturing. The, uh, the Native Americans out there used those longleaf pine trees and we're pretty sure that those canoes made their way all through this part of Florida. So the, the uh, history of this place is all about the longleaf pine. When I was living in Windsor, in the old Windsor post office, which you can still drive by and see, it was built in 1884, it was built out of the local longleaf pine. That wood is so tough that to drive a nail, I used to have use a brick hammer and masonry nails just to drive the nail into the wood because normal nails would bend and normal hammers wouldn't do the job. But the whole area around Noonan's Lake in eastern Alachua County was uh, naval stores, it was, there were lots of turpentine mills out there, and when they started sawing the timber in the uh, 1870s, 1880s, the Gainesville Hawthorne Trail, which was a, a rail at that time, had 25 trains a day, and they were taking not only agricultural crops, but a lot of lumber over to Palatka, where it would be loaded on two equal lumber schooners, and floated up the river until the water got deep enough and then they would load it on bigger ships. And much of Charleston, South Carolina and Savannah and Jacksonville, many of those uh, buildings and, and homes were built out of longleaf pine from Alachua County, Florida. That, that commerce in longleaf pine was so important that when the rail line it was originally narrow gauge that when it was time to move it out to standard gauge to hook up with the other rails that were coming into Gainesville, the 32 miles of that rail line, um, the rails were moved out in one night because they didn't want to disrupt the commerce. So they had enough crews to completely expand that rail line and change the wheels out on all the trains. So it's been very important. If you look at the landscape all around this part of the country, uh, this part of the, the county, what you'll see are old tram lines where they would bring the big logs out and you'll see canals uh, into places like Noonan's Lake. If you go, if you look at the bottom of Noonan's Lake, there's still tons of longleaf pine uh, trees still chained together, still with the, the owner's mark on them, where they were being floated over to the Perry Sawmill, which was right there next to the old Kate's Fish Camp. The, uh, so longleaf pine's been very important for this area, but uh, we know that in the 1950s, uh, the last of the, the commercial longleaf pine forests were, were being cut. And if you look at that, there was a 1952 master's thesis uh, that there was an ornithologist who was trying to figure out what birds appear in what ecosystems. And so he was looking a lot at the longleaf pine forests all around this region and counting the birds and so forth. But what's interesting is he shows the pictures of what those forests look like. And we have totally forgotten what Florida looks like uh, because those forests had 50 trees per acre. They had a beautiful understory. Uh, there were fires that would frequently uh, cross the landscape uh, on an annual or biannual basis. And 
all of the plants and animals had been sort of uh, co-evolved with that fire ecosystem. The longleaf pine, the southern longleaf pine savannas were the most floristically diverse ecosystems in the western hemisphere. There are more flowering plants in the understory of those, of those great pine trees. And one of the reasons that it was uh, so easy for flowers to make it was the other plants, the, the palmettos and the, uh, and the wire grass that grew down there provided the structure for the flowers. So if you actually look at most of the plants that grew in the longleaf pine ecosystem, they were relying on the understory that was reliant on the fire to support them. So um, we've forgotten what that's like. We used to have elephants. Just 10,000 years ago, there were elephants that went all through this landscape. And I found a mastodon tooth in the bottom of Prairie Creek not too long ago. And they were part of the forest that kept the, the forest so open uh, and basically allowed the a uh, longleaf pine to evolve because nothing eats a longleaf pine. No pine beetles, no nothing. And one of the reasons why it makes such beautiful lumber is that it's so tough. So where are we with longleaf pine today? It's being replanted by uh, largely on public lands, but uh, also by private landowners who love it. And so the, the role of a place like Goodwin Lumber is to keep the beauty of the longleaf pine and the strength of the longleaf pine as a product that we all can see and enjoy through this period while they get the last of longleaf pine from the, the 1900s. Someday that will run out. And the hope is that this business 100 years, 100 years from now will be using lumber that we are planting today and it will have the same fine characteristics as the old growth lumber that they're using. Um, so keeping that aesthetic, both aesthetic of the landscape and aesthetic of the product is really important. And so if you look at the places that are really doing a good job with longleaf pine, one of them is up in the uh, Panhandle, Florida in the Red Hills area. And for anybody who has not been to the Wade Tract, the Wade Tract is a, an old growth tract of longleaf, which is what all of Florida used to look like. <clears throat> and what you will see if you go there are 400 year old longleaf pine trees, or, or some, some are probably even older, and the most incredibly beautiful landscape. And so I like to think that uh, the, the only way that that kind of forest is going to be there in the future is if people care about what longleaf pine means, what it means to us in our history, what it means to us in our landscape, what it means to plants and animals, what it means to the buildings. Because if you look at the really great buildings in downtown Gainesville, all those old Victorian houses, all of those are not only framed with longleaf pine, many of them have longleaf pine flooring and uh, paneling and so forth. And so it's really, I view what the good ones are doing here as preserving our history and hopefully preserving our future. So thank you very much.